so thank you uh, so much for coming. I know it's the last talk of the uh, entire conference, so I really appreciate you being here. Uh, I also have absolutely no clue why en I ended up in the data track, because this talk has absolutely nothing to do with data, big data, analytics, or anything like that. And in fact, I think you know, the fact that people associate IoT with sort of data is a bit of a you know, throwback to like 2000, I don't know, 14 or 15. I think there's much more interesting uh, things are playing out on the edge you know, uh, when it comes to operating systems. And that's actually what this talk is all about. But um, before, uh, before I actually uh, explain to you, you know, what we've come up with, let's try to take a look how we actually get here. Right? Uh, so in the beginning, you know, computers were really big right? and uh, awkward to use, you know, cost really a lot of money. And then you know, they sort of got smaller and you know, more affordable, but they also split, right? So the thing on the left is IBM 360, you know, something that you would use for enterprise computing. And the thing on the right is basically a panel uh, that is actually a computer. You know, part of it is analog, so it's an analog computer you know, in part, but it's actually a computer that was installed in the Soyuz uh, space you know, spacecraft right, to basically calculate trajectories and make sure that you know, the rocket doesn't fall back to Earth. It's still a computer, but it's a very different computer compared to this IBM 360 system on the left. And then you know, came the uh, uh, PCs, you know, the PC revolution. So again, on the left for the business user, uh, we had a Spark station. Uh, and on the right, we started to see PLCs, you know, programmable logic controllers being deployed you know, everywhere. Uh, factories, you know, trains, you know, buses, you, know, you name it, right? You know, basically, again, we sort of still have that split. Uh, now, finally came the cloud, right? So now if you do any kind of business computing, you probably go back to Amazon or Google or you know, Microsoft Cloud and you do all of your cloud computing there, which is kind of like what it used to be in the mainframe era. Uh, but on the right, we sort of are still stuck with embedded system. Uh, and there's actually not really that big of a difference between a PLC controller and an embedded system, you know, let me tell you. And even today, I mean, most of the wearable devices, you know, most of the stuff that's around us, you know, factories, again, you know, all of these things, they're still designed as though they're an embedded system. So is there actually a problem with that? Well, I submit to you that uh, today's embedded system architecture is basically predicated on the fact that uh, those small computers uh, are supposed to be really small, right? You know, uh, we designed for basically machines that had, you know, just a few kilobytes of RAM, you know, didn't have really much of a persistent storage to speak of, you know, had really slow CPUs. And that was, you know, that used to be very true. Uh, the problem is that because of the economy of scales, you know, because of the mobile devices, a lot of that has changed. So now it's actually cheaper to get uh, a really powerful, you know, um, ARM64 CPU than try to go back and do some kind of a Z80 you know, microcontroller unit, right? Just because of you know, the economy of scales and you know, how much of these things are produced for the cell phones, you know, the cost factor definitely dropped down. So the only thing that should stop you from actually using pretty much you know, general purpose CPU for the embedded side of things is probably power consumption. So it still consumes more power than you know, a typical sort of wearable CPU would consume. Uh, but again, that is a very, very narrow domain of what embedded systems are used for. So like all of that stuff, you know, that is controlling robots at a Tesla plant, you know, there's absolutely no reason for them to be underpowered, you know, the way they are. So the question then becomes, okay, so if we can afford, you know, uh, smarter and bigger CPUs, what can we do with them? Well, uh, the problem is that given the today's architecture of embedded systems, not much. Because all of the embedded system design, again, has been predicated on essentially a very purpose-built system uh, where there was no really reusable components you know, that much. Or even if they had reusable components, when you built an image, it's not like within that image you can basically upgrade components independently like we used to, you know, we by now used to do in the cloud. So it's not like you can just upgrade you know, the operating system or the middleware or the application. So basically with embedded, you're always building the stacks, you know, these fully integrated stacks. And the trouble with that, of course, is that in the terminology of cloud people, you know, all of these things are pets, right? You know, you know how in the cloud there is difference between pets and cattle. You want everything to be cattle because it's just much easier to manage. And in the cloud, we used to have pets. Uh, and unfortunately, on the embedded side, you know, they're still stuck with pets. Some of them are nice pets, you know, some of them are 
you know, weird pets, and some of them are actually downright evil pets, because, you know, once that pet gets compromised with, you know, something like a botnet, how the hell are you, you know, supposed to patch it, right? You know, it's like, it's not like you can upgrade your OpenSSL to a different version, you actually have to upgrade the entire system. So that's, you know, that's a big deal. But maybe uh, the systems that we use for embedded, you know, again, all of these, you know, things controlling, you know, industrial equipment, maybe they are fine like that, right? You know, maybe there's just a single purpose build system, and you don't feel really supposed to even connect it to the internet. So if you don't connect it to the internet, maybe we can still survive with them. Well, I submit to you that we cannot. And the reason we cannot is this uh, trend that actually started in Germany uh, towards Industry 4.0. Uh, I hate to say it, but I think, you know, Germany and China is way ahead of everybody else on the planet in that. But basically, these guys are talking about, you know, how can you go from essentially sort of this type of a, a factory that was given to us by a third industrial revolution to more of an autonomous factory that is fully cyber-physical enabled, right, where you basically have systems that can adapt uh, to a product that you're building, right? So the factory itself becomes, you know, software-defined. And the only way you can do that is, well, you actually have to do two things. First of all, you have to connect all of the systems, you know, that are currently embedded systems to the internet, because you need to uh, gather as much data as possible from the factory. And that's, by the way, the only place where the data will be featured in this presentation, right? You still care about, you know, collecting all of the data points, right? And second of all, because all of your factories are now becoming software defined, you actually have to have an ability to rev up the software that's running on these control systems every single time. So let me give you an example. I was actually talking to a customer who is basically into oil and gas. And, you know, we were discussing, you know, sort of price of crude and, you know, all that. And at some point he looks at me and says, like, I think you misunderstand what kind of business we're in. And I'm like, what kind of business are you guys in? About getting stuff from the ground and selling it on the market? And he goes, no, that used to be true 10 years ago. Now we're basically in business of reconfiguring carbon molecules. And yes, most of these raw source of carbon molecules still comes from the ground, that is absolutely true. But we're in business of figuring out what configuration of carbon molecules can fetch the highest price on the market as of this given moment, right? So if it's, you know, maybe aviation fuel, we will do that. If it's plastics of some sort, we will do that. Again, we're still extracting these carbon molecules from the crude oil, but we are no longer treating our refineries as a fixed one-time build product. We want to have software-defined refineries. And of course, if you want to do that, you know, then you basically have to have configurable software to manage those things. Uh, Tesla is basically building a uh, conveyor belt, you know, sort of the factory, pretty much the same way, because they are trying to anticipate what kind of products their customers would want, so they don't want to end up with the same uh, style of factory that Ford and, you know, more classical automotive companies have, where they basically predict that for the next, you know, 10, 15 years, they will be building a certain model. And then they just like go and build out those factories, you know, in different places, you know, depending on how they project the market to evolve. And then they kind of stuck with them, right? You know, it's like if that model, if, you know, all of a sudden pickup trucks are not selling anymore, well, they're still stuck with the factories, right? So we have to transition to this new model where the factory becomes really software defined. And the only way, as we know, is to make sure that we, as software engineers, can actually manage software on all of the systems that are running in the uh, industrial setting. I mean, there's different other applications. I mean, I can talk about your home uh, edge, uh, but I think, you know, this will be the biggest driver for uh, the flexibility on the edge. So to put it, you know, uh, in a concise slide, I think our industry typically goes through waves, right? You know, we basically go between centralization and decentralization. So enterprise computing in the 80s, like I said, was all about workstations, which actually replaced, you know, mainframes. Then came cloud computing, which is all centralized. So now everybody does, you know, computing on this centralized resource in the big cloud. And I submitted to you that by 2020, we will basically see the emergence of the edge computing. And edge computing today, to me, means three things. So it means autonomous. So basically, the system that runs on the edge doesn't actually have to talk to the big cloud in the sky all the time. I mean, it may, but it doesn't have to. Second of all, it means real time. So you basically have to be really close to the physical objects, you know, physical world. And it has to be cyber physical in a sense that the behavior of this thing has to be software defined. So, uh, more specifically, uh, I think, you know, this is a helpful analogy. So today, all of the things, you know, people talk still about Internet of Things, you know, all of the things on the edge, they basically have a very simple routing uh, of the traffic and sort of communication, right? You know, pretty much 
the game today is how can we get data out of those things into the cloud as quickly as possible. You know, MQTT and all the other protocols basically are aimed at like, okay, so we don't trust the edge. Edge is really inflexible because of all the reasons I told you about, you know, in terms of the, how the embedded industry is putting things together. So the best we can do is just fetch out, you know, all of the data points and just like do useful stuff with them in the cloud. Again, I really believe that this is very inflexible to the kinds of applications that we will build, be building on the edge, you know, especially for the industrial use cases. <laughs> so I submit to you that, again, maybe it's by 2020, maybe it's by 2025. You know, we as a startup company really feel that it will be by 2020, but who knows. We will transition to this picture at the bottom where you will see a lot of the meshing uh, actually happening on the edge itself. And yeah, sure, there will be some still communication with the big cloud in the sky. The cloud is not going away. You know, don't make any mistake about that. Uh, but you will see a lot of the data processing actually happening on the edge itself. Moreover, you will see a lot of the AI happening at the edge itself. You will see not just AI as in recognition, you know, sort of the uh, uh, training side of the AI, but you will also see the actuation side of the AI coming to the edge you know, in a very, very big way. To give you an example, so again, the customer, another customer of ours, you know, they're basically managing traffic lights, you know, in pretty much, you know, all major cities in the United States and, you know, other countries. So today, they basically have an ability for the traffic lights uh, to communicate with the cloud, right? And that's, that's cool. But what they want to do, they want to basically try different machine learning models. Uh, that are local to the given chunk of the city, right? So they would like traffic lights to actually communicate between each other and based on the localized information, figure out how they can behave as a cluster, not as an individual traffic light. So again, for that, you would actually definitely have to have something like uh, at the bottom. So the question then becomes, can we actually fix the problem of embedded computing incre incrementally? And let's, let's, let's run with this argument, so maybe we can. Uh, when you do embedded computing today, you know, when you connect things to the cloud, you actually have to care about three things. You have to care about security, you have to care about management, and you have to care about networking. Like that is literally what it means to actually be IoT, Internet of Things, right? Without those three, you know, you're not really either internet or you're not a thing, uh, or I guess you're not off. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. And in security, I mean, there are different things that you have to care about, like runtime, you know, trusted compute, PKI. I mean, management is sort of the same deal. You have to care about management of the device itself and the application that's running on the device. Uh, you have to care about overlays and VPNs and monitoring networking-wise. And honestly, today you have startup companies in every single segment, right? You know, all of them are trying to integrate with some embedded Linux distribution or maybe, you know, something like, um, you know, RTOS uh, systems, you know, real-time operating systems. There is no shortage of these companies, right? You know, some, some of them are actually pretty big. Cisco, for example, is a big player uh, on the internet side of the, uh, of the edge. Uh, but the problem is, the problem with all of this is that uh, it is actually to the customer, very difficult to integrate. It exponentially explodes the cost of you know, actually acquiring the entire stack. And it leads to this proliferation of really ugly architectures where something was cobbled together and it kind of sort of works, but you know, next thing you know, it's actually used you know, to mine Bitcoin and you know, all of your sort of industrial infrastructure is now owned by you know, somebody in a, uh, in a completely different country. Uh, so, what we decided to do as you know, a whole bunch of sort of ex-cloud people, uh, we decided to basically fix it, you know, the way we fixed it in the data center. Because if you think about it, I mean, data center used to be as ugly, right? You know, in the data center, everything used to be a snowflake. You know, we used to manage service as individual entities. Like, it was just like really, really, really painful. Uh, and then we kind of decided that, you know, containers and uh, virtualization and uh, things like Kubernetes and Docker, actually a much better way to do it. And now we just treat our compute infrastructure as just substrate, right? We don't really like, honestly, today I just care about, you know, producing my Docker container. And if the operating system that runs the Docker container is made on Mars, I wouldn't know, right? Like, I don't care. Like the question of what is it compatible with? Like is your application compatible with a given up, up, uh, you know, operating system? That question stops being interesting to me. The only question I'm asking is can that operating system run a Docker container? And then I'm off, off to the races. So if you think about it that way, then uh, what we are trying to do, sort of our way of trying to fix this problem, is we're basically trying to find what is the intersection between the cloud technologies and the embedded technologies, and we're trying to operate in that space. Uh, and if you look at it more from a business angle, uh, you know, we're basically trying to see how we can make sure that OT, which stands for operational technology, and IT people can actually talk to each other in a meaningful way, right? 
Uh, I would say OT in general. I mean, people who basically care about HVAC systems in the building or people who care about you know, physical security of this building, right? This is OT or you know, in a factory, in a factory setting, that would be like people who actually manage robots and you know, industrial ethernet network, right? You know, these are OT people. Uh, so I would, I would say to you, and again, I, I actually say it lovingly. I mean, I, I, I don't diss them. Uh, it just so happened, right? You know, but it so happened that OT is now stuck behind IT by, I would say, about you know, 10 to 15 years, right? So we actually anticipate that all of the cool stuff that happened to IT 10, 15 years ago, which was Amazon, AWS, you know, cloud computing, all of that, is actually about to hit us in OT because that's the only way to manage you know, the complexity that's about to hit those people. So uh, what we're trying to offer instead of the traditional um, uh, embedded sort of worldview of how to build your systems. Well, obviously, I mean, there still has to be hardware, and you know, we are very cognizant of the fact that that hardware will not be as powerful as a you know data center machine, you know, that you buy from Dell or you know HP or any of those guys. But it still won't be as you know low powered as what an embedded assumes today. So it typically would be like at something again. Think about that same idea of like OT is stuck behind IT by 10, 15 years. 10, 15 years, we actually used to have computers in data centers that already did cloud computing, right? And if you look at the specs of those computers, it's kind of what you're actually about to find on the edge today. So it's like about you know, one gigabyte of RAM, about one gigahertz of CPU power. You know. Again, you can basically divide this number you know, by, by half, like that's still kind of like the same ballpark, right? You know, like tens of you know, gigabytes of flash. The cost of that system today is five bucks. Right? And I'm talking actually fully enclosed system. If you're just buying an SOC, it's a couple of bucks. So again, it's just economically feasible to build the system that we used to have in the data center you know, 10, 15 years ago. So what do we do with this system? Well, we submitted to you that you, know, you basically uh, abstract the hardware complexity away the same way we do in the data center. So you actually put a hypervisor in. And the hypervisor, you know, the virtualization, is actually now possible because all of the major CPUs, you know, Intel, obviously, but also ARM and soon uh, RISC-V, they actually support virtualization extensions. And again, think about economy of scale. It's actually much more expensive for the CPU designers to take them out than to keep them in. <coughs> Right? Uh, if they develop them for a use case that is a data center use case, it is now much more economically uh, viable for them to just keep producing the most common denominator and not really look into you know, tweaking it to save you know, a couple of cents. Right? So pretty much all of the systems that you see on the market today can support virtualization. So you put a hypervisor in and then you're basically off to the races in the very same way that you know, a cloud sort of computing platform would be built today. So uh, you basically put you know, a few microservices on top of that and then you put applications, right? And one cool thing that you can do with the application is if today your industrial PC just runs Windows, you could basically do the same trick that VMware did you know, back in 2000 and 2000 up to 2005. You can show up and you can say like, well, if you run you know, this system, we can just lift and shift that you know, Windows you know, based SCADA application and it would run on the hypervisor as nothing has happened. In fact, it actually will be better off because I can guarantee you that it's probably running on something as old as Windows XP, sometimes Windows 95, you know, in most of the industrial settings. So I can at least, you know, protect it from the firewall perspective, right? You know, because on the hypervisor, I can fully control what it can and cannot talk to. I can fully control how it uses resources. In fact, you can actually upgrade your hardware because I can bet my, you know, 10 bucks that if you buy the new hardware, the old Windows XP or Windows 95 won't have drivers for it. You know, but with my hypervisor, it's just the back end of my virtualization system, so I can still mimic you know, whatever the system used to be that, you know, when you install it. But of course, again, we all know that in the cloud, you know, it started to be that way, but then we very quickly transitioned to containers and you know, there's a very quick transition to Lambda. So we don't want to spend as much time as cloud spent on sort of figuring it all out. We just want to bring all the same technologies to the edge. And you know, then, of course, because it's all virtualized, you can now move applications between devices, so they're no longer coupled, you know, siloed stacks. You know, the application is truly detached from the middleware and from the hardware as well. So you may be wondering, I mean, what systems are we targeting, right? So again, what I'm talking about is not some kind of a pie in the sky. We actually have a startup company with real customers. So the majority of our customers actually run a box like that. I mean, not necessarily exactly the same of box, but pretty much the same sort of cost, uh, you know, point. So this is known either as industrial PC or IoT gateway. Uh, it's typically based on Intel. I mean, people kind of you know, like to assume that there is a lot of ARM out there. That is actually not the case. ARM is not really present as much. 
Uh, most of these machines in the industrial setting is still x86. So the cost point is about 500 bucks. Uh, it's typically, like I said, is running, you know, some Windows-based SCADA application, uh, and we're just showing up and we're making it virtualized, right? Now, uh, because a lot of our customers are asking us, like, well, okay, but, you know, ARM is going to show up pretty soon, and we also would like to transition to a much, you know, lower sort of cost uh, point. So the smallest system on which this could run is a seven bucks uh, Orange Pi. So it's basically a CPU from Huawei, you know, Huawei subsidiary called Hi uh, you know, Hi Silicon. Uh, so it's kind of like the same as in Hi Keyboard, and you know, basically, it's very, very similar to what you have in your Samsung phone, right? You know, definitely the same as you know you have in your Huawei phone. Although I don't think anybody in the United States actually has Huawei phones. <laughs> I do, but um, not a lot of other people do. Uh, so again, you can basically go as low as seven bucks, and that that still runs. If you look into how this uh, we call it cloud native IoT edge computing platform is uh, constructed, we basically uh, just to summarize, you know, what I kind of talked about, but just to kind of like make it a little bit more real for you. Uh, so we're definitely uh, looking into decoupling device lifecycle management from the applica application application lifecycle management. So uh, in the marketplace, you now have the same story as you have with servers in the data center, right? You know, basically, you no longer have to give whatever it is that you will be running on the system to the actual manufacturer of the system. Because imagine how stupid it would be if you, as a data center guy, would have to talk to Dell people to make sure that they pre-install all of the software that you would be using in your data center. That is literally what is happening today with Edge and IoT people, you know, in the industrial setting. They actually have to go to manufacturers like, you know, Supermicro and Advantech and, you know, Avnet, and they have to tell them what is the exact stack, stack of software that needs to be pre-installed in those systems. So what we are doing, we're basically decoupling that, so you can actually ship blank boxes, you know, just pre-installed with the virtualization layer that we're working on, and then you can decide what applications you would be running on that. The applications, of course, could be either VMs or containers or, you know, even uh, Lambda's uh, function as a service. We pay a lot of attention to security and robustness. So basically, uh, our goal is to make sure that nobody ever has to roll a bucket truck and, you know, physically touch a device. Because, again, a lot of times today, if, this device, if the device breaks, uh, people basically have to physically walk to the device and, you know, they have to stick a USB stick in or, you know, some kind of like uh, serial console into it and actually try to figure out what's wrong, what's going on, right? Again, we're trying to make sure that you always have the control point, you know, on the sort of other, other side of the hypervisor and you always have a networking way of exercising that control point. So an analogy here would be how many of you do know about WhisperNet from Amazon? Do you, do you guys know about WhisperNet? Okay, one guy. So WhisperNet is basically what's built uh, into your Kindle, and you don't even know that it's there, right? You know, you just know that when you turn it on, it somehow magically connects, and it actually connects in most of the countries on Earth. Well, what's happening behind the scenes, of course, is, you know, there's basically a small LTE modem, right? You know, there's a SIM card that Amazon is more than willing to pay for, because their, you know, theory is that if they give you that connectivity that you don't have to pay for yourself, most of the time you will be downloading books and they will more than recoup their costs of, you know, paying to the third uh, party uh, providers of the LTE connectivity. So same idea here. So all of these devices will basically be fitted with uh, essentially networking capabilities, you know, sometimes LTE, sometimes, you know, we're working with some of the 5G uh, manufacturers. And that control point is something that we would basically uh, always have. So we can always, you know, make sure that the device is operational uh, and the customers don't have to pay for it. Uh, we are also trying to basically spend a lot of time on making sure that we are adding value for the brownfield applications because a lot of the edge computing platforms today, IoT computing platforms today, they kind of start with this, you know, presumption that, well, all of that, you know, stuff that I talked about, that is true, and thus, you know, people will just start writing new applications. While that is, you know, true to some extent, I don't think you can underestimate the power of legacy. And I mean, every successful computing platform, you know, starting from Windows, actually showed us that if you pay a lot of attention to legacy, you make a lot of money because, you know, that's what people are willing to pay for. So again, we're very focused on making sure that, you know, that Windows application still runs fine. So in terms of the architecture, just, you know, uh, going a little bit deeper into the stack, 
Uh, we obviously have the devices. So on the device, you would have you know, virtual machines. Uh, sometimes you would have virtual machines that are tiny. So the way to build that type of a virtual machine is called a unikernel. Uh, a unikernel is basically stripping down the operating system to just bare essentials. Now, again, it still runs on the hypervisor, uh, but it's basically a single process, you know, single address space that doesn't really have any notions of users or multiplexing or anything, right? You know, it's just basically a way to construct an image that looks like a virtual machine, uh, but inside of it is just like a single application. Uh, and then, you know, we would have to uh, have a whole bunch of this unikernel. So we're actually using unikernels ourselves uh, as our services that would provide networking and some of the other capabilities. Now, uh, all of these devices will basically connect to, you know, some of the enterprise networks, you know, some of the shop floor networks, you know, and that is something that we have no interest in sort of helping the customer with. I mean, those networks, they would have still to, you know, maintain somehow. But we can help them virtualize access of the applications to these networks, right? And same deal with I.O. So, but then, of course, you know, this control point would also connect to the big cloud in the sky. So that cloud, you know, we are operating one version of that cloud as a SaaS offering. But we also have customers who would like to deploy those clouds on site. So that control point basically remains, let's say, on an oil rig. Because an oil rig, you know, has tons of these edge devices, but unfortunately, you know, it cannot really count on being able to connect even, you know, through the satellite, you know, to the big cloud in the sky all the time. So we're also selling it as a, as a, as a software offering as well. So like I said, I mean, we're decoupling device and application lifecycle management. Uh, so uh, there's, you know, some, some of the pre-installed runtimes, but we can basically, depending on how uh, the communication with the cloud goes, uh, we can add additional building blocks uh, and that would be just fine. In terms of the hypervisor today, we're using type one embedded hypervisor, uh, which is Zen today. We're also looking into this project from Intel called Acorn uh, that recently been donated to the uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, Zen on ARM actually has very little to do with Zen on Intel. And Acorn is sort of what Zen on Intel would have been if it was designed by the same guy who designed Zen on ARM, right? So it's like much more uh, appropriate for the embedded uh, worldview. Uh, you know, we still like Zen. I mean, Zen is a little bit bloated, I would say, on Intel. But I think, you know, those guys are doing a nice job of actually cutting down on some of that bloat. And we're still actually not really hypervisor, you know, uh, opinionated, right? Zen worked for us today. We actually have to have a type 1 hypervisor, so KVM would not work. Uh, the reason for that is because we actually, like I said, we have to support a lot of legacy, so that includes real-time operating systems. Uh, we cannot count on Linux kernel scheduler to basically uh, deliver on the uh, real-time operating systems guarantees. Uh, type 1 hypervisor allows us to statically partition the hardware and basically you still get uh, a little bit of an overhead, right, you know, but you can predict it in a much more meaningful way. So again, very quickly going through the architecture, like I said, I mean, we're basically supporting, you know, three types of workloads. Uh, so we're basically supporting sort of Linux containers, you know, in a different uh, fashions and we're supporting unikernels running directly on the hypervisor. Uh, there's actually a fascinating amount of unikernels research, you know, happening right now. So, for example, what we're doing ourselves, because almost all of our stack is written in Go, we're actually using this project called Atman OS that allows Go to compile directly to an executable that can run on Zen. So, uh, and from the Go standpoint, it's actually really cool because all you have to do is specify, because Go kind of like builds the cross compilation right into the tool chain. All you have to specify is Go OS equals Atman and out pops a binary that can actually run directly on Zen. That's actually like super cool. Uh, so some of the hardware partitioning that we do is, you know, we are sort of experimenting mostly with, you know, real-time scheduler um, sort of on these uh, boxes right now. And we can basically realize, you know, different types of um, topologies, you know, for that. Uh, in terms of the microservices that we've developed ourselves to enable the platform, so think of it this way, right? So basically there's a few, um, there's a few microservices right here that are essentially making sure that the hardware can be trusted. So we are basing all of the trust in the system essentially in the hardware itself. The root of trust is either in the TPM or uh, you know, trust zones on ARM. Uh, we're basically virtualizing it back to the applications, but all of the crypto material never leaves the box. So our promise to the customers is that everything that we build into our system, you know, including the hardware itself, basically has a crypto identity associated with it, which you can then use to route as well. 
because the VPN that we are building right into the system, uh, where is it? Right here, Z router, uh, is based on this protocol called Lisp. Nothing to do with the language, everything to do with the, one of the RFCs. Uh, and Lisp basically allows you to define IPv6 you know, addresses, you know, however you want, because it's an overlay. So what we're doing, we're basically taking a hash of the private key, uh, of a public key, you know, of essentially key pair that was generated by the TPM itself, and we're using that hash as an actual IP address, right? You know, because IPv6 gives you, you know, 128, uh, you know, size. We can actually do quite a bit with that. Uh, so it's actually very interesting. You know, I'm kind of like highlighting a lot of things, but you know, if you're curious, you can talk to me about the uh, about all of that. You know, after the talk, uh, there's actually a lot of end-to-endness uh, -end in what we're trying to do. Because again, remember, we're actually building the system from scratch. We're not trying to fit into any kind of real-time operating system or any kind of you know existing Linux. You run our software as a baseline, as a, as a host OS, and then everything else gets expressed as a VM, so we don't really have to integrate with anything but the hardware itself. So there's basically like a few microservices that have to do with essentially managing the secrets and managing the crypto identity of the device. Uh, then there is the orchestrator that basically just makes sure that we run containers and VMs. So think of it as a Kubernetes you know, agent or you know, like a pod agent. Uh, and then there is basically a few microservices that have to do with I.O. Because one very interesting difference of the edge you know, versus data center is that in the data center, you never really have to think about virtualizing I.O. too much. Because there's not really much of it. I mean, there is networking, and that's about it. Uh, on the edge, you basically deal with a zoo of I.O. I mean, there is industrial Ethernet, there is Modbus, there's just, like tons of stuff. So we're trying to virtualize a lot of that and present to the software sort of this coherent view of um, what the I.O. is. So again, you know, that's kind of how we view ourselves. Um, there's also a bit of a security element, like I said, I mean, there's device security, software updates, uh, network security, and cloud security. Uh, and uh, again, this is mostly just kind of like capture the high level points, but we're using tons of standards, you know, like TLS and, you know, TPM and, you know, stuff like that. So it is pretty standard compliant, but again, because we don't have to integrate with anything, we can actually do a much better job of what, you know, compared to what like a traditional Linux distribution would have to struggle with. Um, so, there's a lot of interesting, you know, ideas on the TPM. So again, talk to me about the uh, TPM after this presentation. Uh, and we're also doing essentially key management, you know, in the same way that HashiCorp is doing it with, you know, some of the things that they are trying to build. Uh, but we're actually, again, building it right into the platform, so you don't have to worry about where you store your keys, even if the image, you know, let's say a Docker image actually needs to have an access to uh, a private key. So that gets handled by the platform itself. Finally, a really cool thing that we're also working on is protecting the application from the operating system, not just the uh, operating system from the application. Because typically so far it's been one way, because it's like, well, I mean, your hardware is trusted. Like in an Amazon data center, you don't expect people to hack hardware. On the edge, it happens all the time. So if you have an application, you actually have to protect from the uh, host operating system being hacked. So we're looking into Intel's SGX and ARM Trust Zones for that. There's a very interesting uh, project going on in a sort of, on one hand, very unrelated, on the other hand, very related space called uh, Golem. You know, it's sort of this uh, blockchain, you know, uh, uh, computing project. Uh, and we're kind of like trying to sort of work with those guys to figure out what we can do there. So the name of the project that uh, we're about to open source, because hey, it's actually all going to be open source pretty soon, uh, is called Project Eve, Edge Virtualization Engine. Uh, and we're trying to do it within Linux Foundation uh, umbrella. So with that, if you forget every single slide and every single line that I told you about today, remember this. So Eve is to the edge computing what Android has become for mobile computing. That's our true belief. And hopefully 2019 will be the year of Eve. With that, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much. Do we have time for questions or are we really out of time? In seven minutes, okay. Yeah, very, very okay, any questions? <coughs> cool, awesome, all right, thank you so much.